Before we get into today's show, I'd like to uh, take a second to dedicate this episode of Section 304 to a fellow mountaineer, Duriel Price, who's also known to his friends as Juice. Um, Duriel was a walk-on at the WV, for the WV basketball program and uh, earned the respect of the coaches and, uh, and his teammates. He was the co-captain on the Elite Eight team and was the member of the All Big East academic team. Uh, unfortunately, Juice was killed in a car accident in New York on Friday night, and um, I got word of it yesterday through social media, and uh, his teammates, some of his teammates turned to social media to express their sadness. Uh, Drew Shafino said, um, I love you, brother. Uh, I was just with you in Buffalo. I'm so hurt by the news. Words can't explain how I feel. And then Kevin Pitsnoggle posted uh, that Duriel was a hell of a good guy, and a great teammate at WVU. A lot of memories were made throughout those years, and we'll be praying for his family and loved ones. And uh, we'd like to take a second to honor him, and this show is dedicated to Juice Price. This program contains language that is intended for mature... Or immature. Or immature audiences. Anyone affiliated with this train wreck of a show assumes no responsibility for its content. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to hide the kids and pop the top on a cold one. Coming to you from the extravagant studio at SAA Productions in Charleston, West Virginia, please welcome the inebriated cast of Section 304. All right, everybody, welcome in to Section 304, episode number 12, the We Mess With Texas edition, and uh, I'm Anthony Lewis, and Drinking with me this morning is Matt Durrett, John Crum, and producer Steve, as always. He's manning the ones and twos this morning. This week's show, we're going to talk about WVU's win over Texas, and we're going to look at what this team is starting to do right. And then later in the show, uh, WVU Hall of Famer Bo Orlando will be joining us to talk about his time at WVU. Well, gentlemen, it seems... Like this team is back on the right track. I don't know what you guys think about yesterday's game, but personally, I thought it was one of the best. Um, I think it was one of the best play calling games I've seen all year. I think we know what we have as far as our team is concerned, and it's the first time that it didn't seem like they were just trying to force stuff. They know what they've got, so they were going to it, and which is the running game which seemed to work for me yesterday. It wasn't pretty, it wasn't sexy, but I, it got the job done. And I think that's what we're going to see for the rest of the year. I was going to the, – the getting points off of turnovers was outstanding. That I think that was the difference in the game. I mean, they turned the ball over, I think, five times. And we converted, I think, two touchdowns and a field goal. The sort of – play that turned the game was stopping them and getting the fumble as they were going in the red zone. Right. And then that led to Howard hitting Durant on the uh, deep ball before the half. I think that really, after that, I, I was pretty confident we were going to win. And we, we ran the ball effectively all day. So I, like you said, Lou, we were playing to our strengths. And it looks like going down, we have three games left. You're going to see a lot of Wendell Smallwood complimented by Shell. And this team, to me, is starting to look like a team that plays ball control, that wants to run it down your throat. They will take some shots, but I don't think we're going to see Howard throwing the ball 35 times anymore. No. Let's hope not. It's a shame it took nine games for this guy to see what everybody else has seen all year. Quarterback's not your strength. The run game is. Yesterday's a perfect game plan. Perfect perfect uh all around, all around play. Uh, you you go to your strengths. The only concern I have is why Smallwood's still kind of sharing the ball with with Shell. Well, and you mentioned that yesterday through social media. It's real. I mean, you can't run Smallwood forty times a game. He ran the ball twenty four times, and Shell only got twelve carries yesterday, which is what I've been calling for. They needed to give because in the middle of the season it was more fifty fifty. Now yeah. they're starting to give the ball to Smallwood. You can. I, I think there's ways you can work around that i like seeing the uh when we did pass i like seeing it being the more underneath kind of short intermediate stuff you get the 
Fade route to Shorts for the touchdown. He got the third and short call. I believe there was a ball across the middle to Shorts to keep the ball moving. Yeah. Um, it looks as though the offense is kind of settled, and you've, they, he's he's finally accepted that this isn't going to be pass happy Holgerson gunslinger football because you don't have the tools to do that. So now maybe he has as a coach. I've said he's not ever really shown that he's trying to change. Well, yesterday he showed that he's willing to change a little bit. And I believe he's quoted as saying, at some point it comes down to, I want to win the game and I have to do, and we have to do what's going to get us to win the game. We have to do what's working. So it sounds like he's accepted the fact that while Howard plays hard, he, he's a liability throwing the ball, and this is the way you beat teams. You ground and pound, and you play well, time of possession. He's a liability when he throws the ball 35 times. He threw 12 <laughs> and was 10 and 12 yesterday and was extremely efficient. Still had the nasty pick in the first. Yeah, round. I missed that. I was still in transition. I, it was a bad throw, but he – Horrible I mean, throw. He threw it way behind the guy. It was ugly. The goddamn duck. Is, let's, uh, look, I'm not going to knock the kid, but let's not say he's only a liability when he throws it 35 times. He's a liability when you're letting him pull the trigger back there all together because his, his, he doesn't throw a great football. Again, they won. It's a great thing. He's finally accepted the fact that the running game is how you have to go. And like you said, he's, it looks like he's he's got it in there that Smallwood's your guy. I appreciate that. I like seeing that change. I like seeing Wendell get it. I also like the fullback aspect back there. Yeah, Russell yes. Shell runs better with a blocker in front of him. Do you notice the blocking schemes? Uh, they've changed a lot of that. They've stopped that single back stuff, trying to run it up the middle. Yes, they're really trying to. They're they're pulling guys. They put a fullback in. They're pulling the tackles around and giving you some blockers. That touchdown at the end of the game. Uh, we hit a fullback blocking, and he's, he's pulled a tackle or a guard. I mean, that's the if you're going to run the football in the Big Twelve, you can't go single back and try to run it through up between between the, uh, the the center and the guard. That's just not going to work. And actually, you saw a lot of that in the third quarter, and it wasn't working. So. I, I don't know what adjustments we've made on the offensive line, but this is the second week in a row where mm-hmm. it looks like we're pushing the other team around. You're looking at Cajuste was out for the third straight week. Uh, Lazard and Marquise Lucas, I believe, started in there tackling guard. That was the adjustments made. But I think the, the line, while they, they looked good yesterday, I think that fullback coming in front of the back adds just a, a – an element that's been needed because it looks like, even though I don't like the guy being back there, it looks like Shell runs better when he has someone taking him to the hole and getting that first guy kind of out of the way and giving him a chance right. to get going. As, as opposed to Shell being seven yards deep, taking the handoff by himself, and then having to decide where he wants to, to yeah, be. Yeah, I think if you put the lead back in front of him and, and he, follow, he, he knows to follow the lead back, I think he runs the ball better. But yesterday, overall, Pretty good win. Uh, you're looking yeah, defensively. Daryl Worley, two picks in two straight games. He gets the fumble recovery. Uh, Baber, Barber with the scoop and score quick, got the pick. Defense looks good as always. And uh, it also seems the, the, the good thing about this running game is you also get that defense some rest. Yep. And you don't want to be continually three and out and allowing – that D to be on the field the entire game the way they are sometimes because that leads to injuries and you you can't have that now because they're banged up as is. But I thought all around great win yesterday. Uh, it's good to see, like you talked about on the way up here, it's good to see Dana get involved there a little bit at the end with the crowd or after the game with the crowd surfing. Looks like he's having some fun and that's, that's good to see. I, I saw Dana from where I sit on the press box side. He was fired up, man. After Howard, Howard, I guess checked down on a third and like seven. Yes, and we didn't get it. It was it was a terrible decision. And it, he it went over. Pa- the, it was a pass yeah. in the flat. We had the four there. four guys, but he went over there and just laid into him. Yeah, and then I saw other guys. I saw Dylan and Henry get into it um, early in the first quarter. We just had that busted covered. So it it tells me that these guys there is a sense of urgency right now. And they want to finish this season strong. So. I think what you what you've seen is is things that we've probably knew going into the schedule. Um, these coaches know where this team is, and I think even maybe the team knows where they are. Although they're not going to say that, and they're going to come out and compete. But looking at October, which now shakes out to be, I mean, look at what Oklahoma State's still doing. Although Baylor's lost, TCU's lost, but that was a tough road. Oklahoma is is still playing well. Um, 
you've got an opportunity to reach what we thought were the goals for this team to be yeah. seven or eight wins. And it looks like if they play like this, they can reach it. Um, but I think what you're seeing is they've, they drew a line in the sand after that, um, you know, after that loss to, um, who we play TCU. TCU yeah. yeah. The, after that game, I think that's where the line was drawn. And they looked at the rest of the schedule and said, we, we need to win out and, and <clears> win a bowl game. And this team's very capable of that. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that we've even talked about was did Dana Holgerson lose this team? And I don't think just don't seeing think that video, just seeing really. that video of him surfing, which was a jab at, um, that's strong, but um, just seeing that type of stuff leads me to believe that he hasn't lost his team, and I think this team's going to come to fight every Saturday. Can you – okay, you, you're looking at uh, Kansas, Kansas State, and Iowa State left. Is seven wins good enough for him to stay? Uh, yeah. Uh, he's not going to get fired. You think so? Seven. No, Absolutely. man. You don't no think way. so? I mean, you might not be happy with well, that. You, you'll I, end up with I eight. won't be happy with that. Well, I, what I'm thinking is you need uh, – I'm not saying – Unhappy or happy? I'm I'm saying it's kind of a, a cupcake ending. Eight or, and four. I think I think yeah. I think eight and four is what what you have to be, and you have to go into the bowl game looking for your ninth. Or I, I would have to say it's a mediocre season. Well, go back. I, people say that, but I go back to what people said at the beginning of the season. We all said it. What were your predictions? I expected eight wins going into the bowl and the bowl game going to be the ninth. And my thought now is just, okay, Octo- October, October October was rough. Was and rough. I think you're upset by October for, for the reasons, of, the, the fact of the reason. You could have beat Oklahoma, but you have poor clock management. You have you're still trying to throw the deep ball all the time. And then the same thing against Oklahoma State. You didn't even show up in the first half. So you let two wins get away from you in October. That's kind of hard to look at and hard to, you know, be pleased with. But you, you've got – you're on a two-game winning streak and you've got these these games coming down the road. And I think that – I think he's got to win out. I don't think there's any excuse not to win out. Well, what I'm even saying. if he loses a game, they're not going to fire. Let's and, – and let's – we'll shift gears <clears> for a second and, and just look at the landscape of college football right now. Look what's happening. There's going to be 20 to 25 coaching jobs out open out there. Really, what do you think is going to happen if you fire a guy like Holgerson who has done – the two things are happening for him. The recruiting aspect has stepped up. He's got – looks like he's – Every getting, receiver, the recruiting aspect has stepped up. At quarterback, we're still lost. Well, you're still – well, you're still getting a lot of good recruits in. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree that recruiting and, has, but – And then if you get – you fire a guy, you hit the reset button on all that. And two, who are you going to get with twenty five coaching, twenty coaching jobs open, and most of them have bigger payrolls than what you got? A, a few of them are better jobs. Let's be frank. That's all. It's always a crapshoot, and I'm not saying you know. Look. Well, hold on. If we let's say we lose the bowl game, let's say we win out, lose the bowl game, we still won five out of six games. I mean, is that a situation where you want to blow this thing up and restart? I, I think Dana knows that Howard. There will be a competition next spring that he's going to continue to develop some of these guys and see what happens. But for right now, I think Howard is what we have. That's all right. We should win the next three games and go to a bowl, a pretty decent bowl game. You want to blow that up, though? That's that's what I'm saying. I mean, we we kind of left this team for dead after TCU and thought we were going to lose to Texas Tech and Texas and go 4-8. That's mm-hmm. not happening now. I mean, you. I don't want to start from scratch. Because no. when you fire a coach – you're basically saying there's no point for this to continue forward. There's no hope. There's no optimism for this regime. It's time to completely start fresh. He's and probably going to be there. He's probably going to get extended. But no I don't – No, no restructure. Well, I tell you another good thing. We can – we have leverage going into the contract negotiation. We can say, hey, man, you did go 8-4, and four, but we're still not where we want to be. This buyout's not going to be $5 million. Yeah. And I – I think he's going to be there. I was talking to somebody about it yesterday. I said, you know, you want to see the team win, but you also, in the back of your mind, you you kind of get the feeling that he's not the guy. And I don't think he's ever going to be the guy. Like, I just don't think he's – I don't think he's taking us to the promised land. What, what's what's the ex- promised land? Yeah, what's your expectation? Here? I think I think every – I think every Division One football program in a, in a big – Conference and who's been on a stage where you're, you know, you're ranked in the top 25 and you, 
you get in there. It might be a long shot, but I think every every expectation should be to play a bowl game after on or after January first and be in the mix for the playoff system. And I don't know that he's the guy that puts you into that into that that realm. I don't know that he's going to get a bowl game after the first of every year. I don't know that he's ever going to be good enough to get us into that playoff you, system. So you say don't know. Are you sure he's not? I don't think he's going to – I don't think he's the guy. There's just nothing about him that's – you know, there's just certain people who seem – tell you what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a coach who came into West Virginia and was the greatest thing since sliced bread, throw the ball 900 times hell. a game, put up these video game numbers on offense, and now he is evolving to we have to run the ball, we have to control the clock – to Play me, defense. that's how you win football games. But will he stay with that? I, I think, with that I think blue this is what lunch pail mentality that, that you saw yesterday. There's certain guys on that team who come to work and understand what, what they're out there and what they're playing for. And they understand, you know, the states behind him and everything. And I think Wendell Small was one of those guys who packs a lunch every Saturday and he brings it to, to the field and he puts his work in and then goes home. I don't know that Dana will ever truly have that mentality. I think he's forced now. He's been put into a spot where he's forced to have to run the ball because he doesn't have another option. And I don't know that he stays with that. And just from what I read in the paper this morning, I don't think he's happy about running the ball over 30 times. He's, well, he's always said that he he runs the ball more than Leach and these other guys. I, I like this direction. I'll be honest with you. Now, I loved what I saw you yesterday. You gotta have the, you, you have the running game and then you have the ability to hit Durant deep. You can put safe, you you have to respect our outside guys and you have to have a cover two back there. I mean, we'll be able to run the ball whenever we want. Listen, teams that win national championships and play on January 1st and after play defense and run the football. Right. Period. We, well, exactly. I, I saw Texas was kind of the mirror image of us. Last year and the year before when we were losing, yes. they had a ton of penalties. They were turning the ball over. I mean, there was a point in the second half when they scored on the first possession where I was like, we can't stop these guys. They were There were points where they were just completely dominating our defensive line. They were 9 of 18 on third down conversion. Yeah, and I mean, they, they but they turned the ball over. And that's they ran for a lot of yards yesterday, but they also had three fumbles. Gets back to my point of what I talked about. What is the key to this team for us is not playing from behind, and I believe you brought it up when you do, when you play from behind like Texas was having to do yesterday because we got everyone got a little nervous when they came out and scored instantly, but we started moving the football and I said, listen, they're going to start playing from behind, they're going to have to start taking they're shots, have to throw. and this kid can't throw, didn't want to and throw. he's going to turn the ball over, and I'll be damned, that's exactly what he did, and that's the position we've been in. Yeah, we've had yeah. to come out and sling it down the field and just pray that somebody catches it. And and when you're in that position, that's the mentality. But when you're in the other position, when you're winning and controlling the ball, you're you see what happens with this team. And I think uh, for the next three games, I think we're on the right course here. The only thing that concerns me is having to go to K State. If that's Bill Snyder's last football game, it's going to be that. Let's win one for the old coach, yeah. and that could be tough. I'm hoping he doesn't make any announcements. Play the goddamn Rooney speech before the game. For yeah, you know, like, do you song. really think, like, for instance, did you really think West Virginia was going to lose to Ole Miss for Coach Nealon's last game? I didn't think we were going to win the game. <laughs> they were favored heavily. We yeah, were, but they were, you know, yeah. it's that that's the kind of thing. We had a huge emotional boost. Right. But back to sort of what this team is morphing into, I – all three of us have watched a lot of West Virginia football over the course of our lives. When West Virginia is good, it's because we can run the ball. Right. But That's the common thread between Nealon, Rodriguez. It, uh, I don't, Stewart's teams ran the, didn't really run the ball that well. They but, ran the ball pretty well against Florida State, and then he decided to stop running the <laughs> yeah. fucking thing and give one to Bowden. So. But is this but, not the shit that we talked about before the season when I said we don't have a quarterback, we should run the ball, we should be run heavy, we should be ground and pound? How come fans can see the shit, but the coaching staff can't? Is he so stubborn and stuck in his ways that he's rich rotted us with the like Rich did with the screen pass against Pitt, and he's taking you out of the national championship game? He's not taking us out of a national championship, but has he cost us two wins in October because he's so stubborn and he wouldn't run the damn ball? I tell you what, unfortunately, we played Baylor in October. Baylor's quarterback's out now. Yeah. If we play totally Baylor different. next week, it would be a totally different game. Yeah, the same goes for TCU. They lost Dotson. Dotson. Yeah, I mean, if we played them again, I mean, it's Didn't just, Boykin get hurt yesterday? 
I think he did. I didn't watch any football yesterday. Somebody in the somebody in the stands was telling me that Dotson played, and I said, I don't think so, pal. You're full of shit. Dotson did not play. I just read about it this morning. He was out. <laughs> and then they said, well, Boykin's hurt too. And I said, I don't, I said, I think you're just completely off base and you're clueless. So I'm just not. And then I, I did say, I, I think Boykin did get hurt. Well, speaking of injuries, did, did anybody hear an update on uh, Karan White? I know he, he, man, the way he came off at first, I thought, oh shit, he broke his hand. And that's not what you need from a, a Juco kid that comes in his junior season is now just starting to hit a stride. But I don't think he came back into the he's game. He's a sophomore, isn't he? I believe he. I think he's a sophomore. He came out okay. Yeah, I think he's a sophomore. So, but what concerned me was I didn't see him back in the game, but I didn't hear any post game comments about it. I, I heard very minimal of the post game. I uh, waited the traffic out a little bit, and then walked on back over. Even to in, the car. well, just in Dana's conversation, his he mentioned uh, how the wide receivers still got to kind of grow up because he, but say, but he threw White's name in there, and he I, didn't say, well, we'll have to see what the injury is. So I'm guessing he's okay. Maybe it's just you know his old bank. I think it's a shame it's taken this long to find shorts. Christ, yeah. What the fuck do you? What's that guy got to do to get you know? I mean, yeah. he's been he's been missing the entire season because they won't throw him the ball. And now he's last couple games. Here you go. Here he is. He's been there all year. Well, I mean, forgotten man. It's all. I think it's always easy for us to sit back. On yeah, some it's always to talk about it. But always easy when you're going, to back. you know, when you go into a game, you look at what things that you think you can do as a coach. And I think um, I would love to be in a position to cash a three million dollar paychecks and call plays on Saturdays, but. We're, I'm sitting here on Sunday mornings trying to dissect it, and um, I, I just think um, at this point, man, I'm just happy this team's didn't fall apart. It doesn't look like they fell apart. It looks like they're going in the right direction. But like I said, the frustrating part for me, and the reason I still don't buy into him, is it's been right there in front of his face the entire damn time. I don't know. I mean, has I mean, it? Ha- we're it still ha- relatively young on offense. Yeah, I, but the, the thing is, man, the running game's been there. Smallwood's 1,100 yards. I mean, we're, we're, he's over a thousand already. He's got a lot of really think you can load the, You're just going to line it up and run straight you at teams have, like but TCU if, and if you If you load that up and you do that, then that opens up play action passes. That opens up a whole other world of offense. That I mean, because it wasn't working against Texas yesterday for a minute. Let's just I say, mean, out just line it up, and this is what we're going to do. Stop me. Well, I tell you what, though, we're moving in the right direction. Skyler, you know, and like I said early in the season. That I kid has to just manage the game. He doesn't have yeah. to – when we turn it into he has term. to win win the game, we're in trouble. He has to manage the game. And um, I think I think they they probably stopped all that check down on third and long type of stuff. Um, we got to. It's going to cost him his yeah, fucking it's gonna, job. Well, it's going to cost everybody. Well, but he's, he played tough yesterday. And, and real quick, let's listen to what Dana said okay. about him. And he kind of took some jabs at the fans and especially the uh, – the media because um, it's it doesn't that. it doesn't uh, doesn't fall in on uh, deaf ears when you boo uh, the kid. So let's listen real quick what Holgerson had to say. Skyler only threw it twelve times, but there were two big time throws he made on his touchdowns. Yeah, he's 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 capable of it. I mean, I've seen him do it a lot. You know, it's it's tough when. You know the confidence takes a hit. You know he he gets booed. He he. I tell him they're booing me, but uh, he gets booed. You guys write nasty articles about him and everything. He he's he's got thick skin. He's a great kid. He's smart. He understands the situation. He's pressing forward, giving it everything that he possibly can. He's got to work out. Of- but like I was saying, we know he's no Joe Joe Montana. He just has to manage. I got a question. Game. Why is the term game manager like negative? I don't understand. I've never I, understood. I look that. at it as if if I'm in his position and you're calling me a game manager, you're saying I'm not a quarterback. Yeah, but he threw. He was ten for twelve and had two touchdowns. It'd be like you have a role on a team, <clears throat> and he's filling this role of yeah, throwing but, the ball. But I mean, when Tom Brady started with the Patriots, this was what they did with him. They were going to run the ball and play defense. The same thing with Roethlisberger. Why is this a negative? If I mean, you're if you're a quarterback. Everybody looks at quarterback. You're 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 the man. You're hot shot. You're flashy. You know. You get the chicks. You and if you're calling me a game manager and I'm a quarterback, I'm not going to take that. But if I'm you win, like, what hey, does man, it matter? Kiss my ass. I'm the court. You know, I'm the quarterback. I'm more than a game manager. I'm the guy. Yeah, but if you win, well, the quarterbacks term, are ultimately judged by wins. The term, the term game manager means stick to the game plan and don't fuck it up. Yeah, I don't understand why that's a bad thing. <laughs> I think most quarterbacks want to look at themselves in a light to where they feel like you know. 
the game lives and dies with them, and they're the ones responsible for the wins. And well, the if losses. he thinks and, that, he's <laughs> smoking crack on the corner somewhere you know, because that's not I just, how I don't up, think game up, manager operates. sounds very flattering. Like, if you're the quarterback, being a game manager is not very flattering. It means that you're probably not in the elite. Everybody wants to be. He's not in the elite. Listen, there's yeah, not man. a lot of elite quarterbacks. You guys watch all games these all day? All these want to think they're elite, though. That's the thing. All the, this, Like I said, the world has become so delusional. Well, we said, you know, and you know where we watch ball games. If I don't go to Morgantown, we're at my friend Allen's house, and he's got five televisions going at once. We sit and watch football from noon until – sometimes 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, five games at a time, I rarely sit back and go, ooh, this kid is a true gunslinger. There are not a lot of elite no. quarterbacks in college football. <laughs> and this is starting because what here's – and there's none in the NFL. I mean, there's not a lot in the NFL. And what you're seeing is 10 years into this spread offense system, now where they're just in peewee it's league, they it. just stick athletes at quarterback in junior high, high school, college – there's no real gunslingers in college football. There's very few guys that can really toss it around on an elite level. So yeah, I mean, there's I a think, lot of game managers out there. Yeah, but it just doesn't sound like people. I think people get <laughs> upset about it because it just doesn't sound good. Like it's What's like, better than calling him a piece of shit. Like you've done a few well, times. <laughs> I never called him a piece of shit. I said he can't get the job done. He's not a good quarterback. We'll have to I'm pull sound. We'll get on that, Steve, next week. We're going to put together a little. It. A little string of Durrett's highlight reel of uh, just name calling of Skylar House. Most of it's for Russell Shell. So you're. I'm just saying, if we get what we got out of him yesterday, we're going to win more than we lose. And I know he's. But it sounds like it sounds like the fucking coach isn't happy with what you got. Like he's not happy to only throw the ball 12 times. It's you know, it sounds like he's not happy. Just be fucking intelligent. Happy if he had intelligent and run the ball. Take what's there for you. Take what's there for you. You have a tailback over 1,100 yards. Shut your mouth. Take what's there for you and win games. Save your job. Don't be an asshole. Don't be the prick that I think you are. I think he's listening to you personally. I think think he was talking directly to (laughs) us yesterday at that press conference. Take what's there for you. If they stop the run, then try to throw the ball. Until they stop it, you keep running it down their goddamn throat, and you make them stop you. And then you run play action passes. You throw it underneath. Stop being a fool. I don't care what your background is. Don't be a fool. Win games, moron. You know, one thing that kind of stood out to me <laughs> yesterday, one thing that really stood out to me yesterday was um, the fact that the receipts, there was no uh, – oh, sorry, I was looking at my – I was off mic there. I, I was looking at the stats, and I didn't see Shelton Gibson, and it, which kind of concerns me. Um, after he, that drop last week, and I said it, I said, I hope he doesn't go back into this – Funk where he just disappears and you know he kind of did that last year he dropped the ball at Alabama and literally could have been just pouring water the rest of the season well he made a couple tackles on kickoff I, I think what you said drawing a line in the sand obviously he's not getting it done in practice if guys are playing over him so I think Dana has basically said if you don't get it done in practice you're not going to play he, he's on the kickoff right now made some good plays which tell me he's still in on this team, he hasn't checked out. Mm. But if you're going to want to, if you want to go out there and get passes, get targets, you better bring it in practice. He yeah. was out there. I think Karan started yesterday. Well, which, yeah, you know. I tell you, what, and that's that's good. For, I love the fact. I like big physical receivers, and I don't mm. think Shelton Gibson's one of those physical guys. Speed he's guy. he's yeah. fast and he can get open. But when you need a guy to run a quick out or something across the middle and stop in the center of the field and squat and catch a ball. Well, look, look back at that play against Texas Tech that was almost a pick six. Yeah. White used okay. his size. It's almost like boxing out in basketball. Yeah, he shielded it. Yeah, and he, I mean, he made a big play. So I think if you're going to throw the ball, you got to use him. I mean, last year Howard almost used Kevin White as, as, as a comfort zone. Just throw it up and go get it. You know, let the big fella do his job. Karan's not much different. It doesn't look. Longer dreads, like Crum pointed out, he's got a tough dread game. But for the most part, if physically and, and looking at him from up in the stands, he looks almost identical to Kevin out there. So well, I think, if anything, that should give him a little bit of a comfort zone to throw to know you got a guy that's going to go get it and he's going to out physical somewhere. Where's Sills? I, he was I don't know. He's the best receiver, receiver ever. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, well, nobody well. can play quarterback. We can't get another one in there under center to get a look at. But maybe he's. Repping a QB in practice now. Uh, you know, just getting back to the QB situation, Dana said it weeks ago, come January, if anyone doesn't tr- transfer out, probably I.E. Willie Crest, I figured Crest would probably bounce, but um, he's going to evaluate who's there, who can play quarterback, and it's going to be open competition. I don't think he's going to come out in spring and go, here's my guy. 
like he did this spring. Yeah. Howard's my guy. But after yeah. two straight years of quarterback competition, it's like, I don't need this. You know, I need my guy to come in and get settled and with, be the man. But With this renewed focus on the run game, if you have a mobile quarterback like David Sills, is supposedly he's one of the best athletes on the team, I think – I think that makes our offense even more potent. I mean, we do run the ball with Sky- Skyler. He does get some yards here and there, gets some touchdowns. David Sills kind of looks like Baker Mayfield. You think so? Statue statue esque wise, like body build for him. He kind of looks like Baker Mayfield. And I fell asleep last night watching Oklahoma, but Baker Baker Mayfield looks like the real deal. The dude can run. He can scramble. He's got. It's not a great arm, but he's got an arm, and he can get it there. He's a game manager. No. <laughs> no, I would I would love to have Mayfield under center in Morgantown, and you would see what that real off, what that offense could do. Mayfield, I think Sills looks kind of like Baker Mayfield, but I've not seen Sills throw the ball, so I couldn't tell you what he plays like a quarterback. I'm just telling you, physically, he has the appearance of a Baker Mayfield with the long stride and all that kind of lanky. I'll take yeah. That. yeah. But yeah. we'll see. We'll see where it goes for next year. And I know that uh, just on the recruiting trail, I know uh, there's a kid out of Miami, Florida. It looks like it's going to come in. It looks like he's pretty good. They've, they've got a shot at him. I think maybe he's committed because position he, does he play? He's a quarterback. Kid. Right now, the only quarterback we have is a two star kid. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying stars matter. No, I, I saw. I think this this kid I saw is a three star kid and um, had some decent offers. Threw for about 352 uh, yards last year in the game. Chugging all is the best quarterback we have, but they don't want to bust a red shirt, which I'm fine yeah. with. But you busted Sills, so let's get a look at him under center. Well, there's no sense in it now. Well, maybe give him some mop up time. For what? Because I'm tired of looking at Skylar Howard. Well, do you want to win? <laughs> I, I said give him mop-up time. We blow one out. Nah. Engineer blowout, Skylar. Well, Let's somebody else get a look in there. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't see any reason hold on blowing, your job. A, blowing a red shirt over the plant. Sills you know? has already been blown his red shirt. Well, why would you blow Chugs? I don't want to. I want to see Sills under center. I uh, want Howard to engineer yeah, a blowout, and then I want to see Sills and Crest under I, center. I'd still like to see Crest get a, a, a well, couple. I think I would love would. to see Crest get some reps. But something ain't kicking there, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, All right, well, here's what we're, we're going to do. We're, we're a little over here on the first half of the Dang show. We're going to uh, go into this break. But before we get there. It's a shame they didn't drop him when he was crowd surfing last night. <laughs> concussed. Oh, Tony's going to have to coach now. Oh, boy. Well, before we go to the break, we're going to announce our Dell Sparks collection prediction winner this week. Brian Collins from Ripley. He predicted 38-17 West Virginia. Mike Bayless didn't enter this week. He probably did. <laughs> I know he did. But uh, Brian Collins of Ripley, he was pretty much on the money, 38-17. So, Brian, you'll be winning one of those sweet pictures from the Dell Sparks collection. Which one are you going to send him, though? I don't know. He kind of just kind of randomly, randomly pick. pick, shake it up, and pull one out of there. Yeah, basically. But uh, be looking for that in the mail. I'll hit you up this morning. Send that guy a Bruce Irvin picture if we got any left. I don't know what's left. Send but we're going to take a break, and after the break, we're going to be talking with Bo Orlando. We'll be right back. Do you love West Virginia? Check out home furnishings by Bear Wood Company. Log into bearwoodcompany.com and put West Virginia pride in your decorating design. The Bear Wood Company, always home. For the best in vintage advertising signs, World War II collectibles, collectible vinyl records, and coins, check out our friends at Red Fox Antiques and Collectibles in Scott Depot, right off I-64, exit 40. This isn't your grandma's antique shop, this is a Mantique shop. For more information, check them out on Facebook or give them a call. 304-757-9589. The Dell Sparks Collection. Dell has documented WVU sports for over 30 years and features the greatest moments in Mountaineer history. Check out his magic moments from Major Harris, Pat White, Tavon Austin, and so many more. For all of your favorite Mountaineer moments printed and framed, visit dellsparks.com or give him a call, 304-296-6004. The Griffith Law Center, PLLC, a Charleston-based law firm servicing the entire state of West Virginia and parts of Southern Kentucky, specializing in serious injuries, wrongful death, and wrongful termination. The Griffith Law Center, now you have a friend that's a lawyer. Call today for a free consultation at 304 345 8999 or give them a visit on the web at protectingwv.com For all of your web and graphic design, go with the best. Go with our friends at Loggerhead Designs 
They're true graphic professionals. Anything from business cards to high-end websites, they can handle it all. The next time you need your ads to really pop, head over to loggerheaddesigns.com or call 910-541-0143. And welcome back, everybody. Section 304, the Texas edition. We messed with Texas. And that was, like I said, we like we said in the first half, good ball game by the guys yesterday. But we are going to switch gears a little bit. And before we get with our guests, we're going to announce our Bearwood Company Fan of the Week. And that is Carrie Smith. Sent out a picture from her tailgate. Uh, looked like she was hanging out with John Flowers. I don't know if he was. that was a new picture. I think he might already be overseas. I think that was old. But... Uh, I, I like that when people send in pictures. They they see former players in the parking lot and get to hang out with them. So, but speaking of former players, we're gonna be we're joined by one of the all time greats, WVU Sports Hall of Famer Bo Orlando. What's happening, Bo? What's what's going on, Ant? Well, we're uh, we've been sitting here talking about the game yesterday, and before we got back on the air here, you had mentioned you weren't able to watch. You've been coaching a little bit. Yeah, I coach. Yeah, I coach uh, my, my at my son's school. I've uh, uh, coach at a Division three school here in Bethlehem, and uh, we were eight and one. And, and uh, you know, we were talking about Texas turning the ball over. We did the same thing. Our offense turned it over, you know, twice inside a ten yard line. And uh, you know, we were down, and we can we can never make up the difference. And you know, big games. That's uh, field position and uh, turnovers is key. You know, um, you're you're coaching. Is that something you're going to continue to do, or is this is something that you wanted to do while your son was there? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's a nice time to plug. I, actually, I got a job. Um, there's a new league starting up. It's called uh, Major League Football, and it's kind of like a feeder league where uh, we're having a draft, and uh, the season is going to be. We just signed a TV deal. The season is going to be from uh, uh, March to June. There's going to be ten games with two playoff games, and most of the guys we're having we're having combines right now. And uh, you know, they say there's over 700 guys that get cut from the uh, from the NFL draft. You know, from the uh, from the camp, so uh, most of those guys are going to be our players, and because uh, I know, you know, playing in my days, I mean, there were so many guys, more guys that could play, but the numbers aren't aren't just there. So I got a job with the uh, the Memphis team. There's going to be eight teams, and I got the DB job with the Memphis team. So I'm, you know, my kids are my my youngest one here. And I'm coaching; he's a senior, and uh, you know, I, I was you know due to divorce and everything, I've, I've been there for these guys and coached these guys, and uh, now you know now I want to move on, get up to uh, major college or NFL. Well, I was that's breaking news to us. I didn't know there was major league football. I have to look that up when we uh, when we get on. Yeah, it's called uh, yeah, it's MLB uh, MLFB uh, dot com, and it's on it's on Facebook. And uh, yeah, and a lot not they have they have announced a lot. They signed a TV deal, and they're working some combines. But uh, it's going to be a nice league. It's, it's almost kind of like the World League, but all the teams are in the states in the United States. Very cool. Hey, Bo, this is Matt, man. Uh, I was just wondering that eighty eight team you played on. You guys went undefeated. Just talk about how hard it is to go undefeated in, in college football and how special that is for you to be a part of a team that achieved that uh, or had that accomplishment. Well, you know, every, everybody heads you. You know, everybody, you get everybody's championship game, and uh, you have to go in every game. And like I said about, you know, about field position and turnovers and, you know, just the, the basic fundamentals, tackling. And, uh, you know, it's tough to be, be on point for, for 11 weeks, especially today with – you know, it's a little bit different. It's kind of hard uh, uh, to compare because uh, you know our, our league was totally different. Our you know we we were you know it was a smash mouth league. I mean everybody would run the ball, you know, big linemen, and uh, now it's all you know pass and so it's hard. It's hard to you know to equate to, to each one of them, but uh, but to stay on point for eleven games, just like Baylor last night. I mean, you know, you slip a little bit, you have a little thing, you're against a good team, and uh, turnovers, and you know that that's a big thing. Hey, Bo, this is John. I was going to ask you, in 87, I guess the team gradually got better and improved over the course of the season. Um, and then that springboarded us to 1988, like Matt said. I was wondering, this team seems to be kind of headed down that path. How do they take the momentum of finishing a season strong with a fairly young team and, and carry it over to the next season for a special season? Well, you know, one one thing we we talk with our guys is believe in one another, trust one another, and do your job, and and, and everybody, you know, every eleven guy does their job, and, and they do a good job. 
And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the thing with us is we were, we had a big class coming in. Our, we had 28 fifth year seniors graduate, which is a, a lot. And, uh, you know, coming up through, we were always a gifted class, but we were always close off the field too. I mean, uh, that's, that's the main thing with us. I mean, our, a lot of our guys still stay in contact and we see each other. It's like we never left. And, uh, you know, we just got closer and closer and, you know, you get to build a, a team and not only a good football team and good players, but you build that structure, you build that family. And, uh, that makes, a, that makes a huge difference. You, and you kind of mentioned it and you hit something that we've talked about a lot on the show. Um, West Virginia is a, is a blue collar <laughs> team. I don't care what conference you play in or, what the air right. raid system is. Um, right. and we've been saying that we thought maybe this team over the last few years has kind of lost that. Um, but, you know, running the football, talk about that blue collar mentality, maybe where a lot of guys weren't, weren't what they would call nowadays, uh, four or five star recruits and where Coach Zeland right. would get these guys and coach them up and, and make them mean. I mean, cause I, I've said it several times on here, teams like Miami would come into town. Yeah, West Virginia may have, may have lost, but they knew they had right. been in Morgantown. Talk about that blue collar mentality. Well, you know, it, you know, it's part of your upbringing. I mean, you know, when, when, when I was, uh, you know, when I was younger, I mean, it was uh, you were laboring, you were working, you're out doing every kind of chore there was, and, you know, if you didn't. And uh, you know, today's a little bit different. Everything's the computers and 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 and, and somewhat so what. So I think. You know, coaching wise, everybody coached the same, uh, back then. It was, you know, it was discipline. It was hard work. I mean, we just, uh, we just banged it out. And, uh, you know, today, today's a little different. Sometimes you got to coach a couple players a little bit different. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, that's the big difference. But I think our upbringing in, in the old times was, was kind of like the old smash mouth. And, you know, you only knew one way. I mean, you know, what, you know, even like, like I said yesterday, we were eight and one and we lost to our nemesis. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think I took it harder than some of the other guys. Like I was pissed off when they were raising the trophy <laughs> up and, and things like that. And right. I just, I just hate to lose. And that's how, that's how I played. That's how I coached. And that's how, you know, all the guys on our team. I mean, it was, you know, you, you played pissed off. And that's what I try to tell the guys for 60 minutes. You got to play pissed off, like you know. This this is our house. This is our family. You know, this is our crowd. I mean, we're you know, it's not only just the team. It's 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 the fans, and you know, it's the, the community, and, and and the name of the college, and you know, just like we come back, like on Facebook or some, I root for all my guys for the Mountaineers, whether I know them or not. Uh, you know, coming to see them because once a Mountie, always a Mountie. And I think that's been different. I talked to. You know, I've always talked to guys, you know, and played with a lot of guys from other colleges, Penn State, this and that, and they have that unity, but they, it's just something about Morgantown when you come and, you know, once you put on that amount of uniform, uh, I don't care if you were, you know, if you were a Hall of Famer or if you were, uh, the last guy on the roster, you, you're a Mountaineer, and I mean, and, and that's that, and, and everybody would help each other out. So, uh, that, I just think it's so special being a Mountaineer. How much do you guys out there on the field listen to, What's going on and what's coming out of the stands being said or, or, you know, if the fans kind of, there's been a situation here where fans have kind of turned on Howard and they, they've let him know that they're not happy with his play with booze and maybe some screaming from the stands. How much does that ever affect you and how much does that really affect you guys in the locker room? And, and do you get, did, was that ever something that, that bothered you? Uh, I, I, I never let it bother me. And, and, you know, and when, when people start to say stuff like that, I mean, if that's where the, the inner, inner team kind of comes where his lineman or his defense got to come and say, Hey, look, man, just let it go. And, you know, and, and, you know, this, this is, this is football. This is up and down. It's like life. This is a roller coaster ride. You know, you're going to be down. You're going to be up and you just got to keep fighting. And, uh, that's what, you know, something I learned there and, um, something that, that, you know, like I said, everything's the community and the fans and everything, but when I get down to it, when they're starting to turn on you or starting to say things, it's up to his family, his close family, his football guys to come and say, listen, don't, you know, don't listen to that. We believe in you. As long as they believe in them uh, on the field, I mean, that's what counts. I mean, you, you hear the crowd and, and it's great to have home field advantage and everything like that and the following that we have, but, you know, when it comes on the field, you can't, you know, that, that stuff's blocked out once you get on the field. You don't have time to think about that. Um, you know, thinking, oh man, I missed that pass. The crowd's going to be on me. I don't, I don't think athletes are, are like that. Maybe off the field, you know, when guys are harassing from the stands, but once you get on the field, I mean, all that stuff just goes right away. Hey, Bo, this is John again. I was, you played in the NFL for at least eight or nine years. Tell us about that experience, maybe some highlights throughout your career. Uh, that was, you know, that was a unique experience. I mean, uh, the first, you know, first two years when, 
Bo Jackson or Montana, or, you know, you're kind of starstruck when you're playing against, uh, you know, when you're playing against guys like that, you idolize and you watch, you know, kind of growing up. And, uh, I know the one of the best stories for me is I'm, you know, I'm from, uh, <laughs> Eastern PA. So I grew up a Philadelphia Eagles fan and my, my dad used to swear at Ron Jaworski up and down. And, um, <laughs> you know, when I, when I, it was funny because I, I mean, I, I was a junior high when he was playing and, and when, uh, I went to Houston. We went to Kansas City to scrimmage him. And, uh, when it was at the two or threes, I went to two or threes and I, I break the huddle and I come out and look who's quarterback. He was in his 19th year. It was Ron Jaworski. So I'm like, wow, this is like, you know, I'm in junior high and now I'm playing against Ron Jaworski. So, uh, it, it's a thing, you know, it's a kind of a Star Trek thing, but, uh, but going through it just becomes, uh, it just becomes a job and, and, and close guys, you know, you know, like, you know, like playing up through high school and college, and uh, but it's nothing. But it's nothing like the the uh, the, the unity you have in college. Because you know, I played for four different teams. I jumped around. So you know, during your playing, you know, it's 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 your banging and banging and everything after the game. How's your wife? How's your kids? You know, this and that. So it's more of a job at that level and a profession. You know, to make money. But college is that. That's where I love the coach. It's that rivalry and it's that the kids are playing. You know, they got a free scholarship. Yeah, but I mean. You know, they're not playing for money and, you know, this corner's not making six million or that guy's not, the rush end's not making eight million a year. So there's no kind of attitude like that. It's everybody wants to get the next level. And, um, it, it, it was a great thing. It was, it was, uh, it was, it's a childhood dream. But, uh, but in the bottom line, you have to learn. And while I was so long, I learned it was a business. And once you learn it's a business, um, you know, you got you got to take care of business and take care of yourself. You're like, you know, Coach Pardee used to say, "Hey, we're independent contractors, and off season you can you can slip and not work out if you want, or you can work harder, this and that." So you were like a 10.99, you know, employer from year to year, and uh, you know that that's the difference. You know, you um, a lot of people know you more as a Houston Oiler. Talk about right. your time in Houston. Um, you played with some pretty big, pretty big names down there. So. Oh. Very, very big names. I mean, we were, I mean, we should have been in a Super Bowl a few years. I played with, God, I played with three Hall of Famers. I, I played with, uh, many, many first rounds. I mean, Wilbur Marshall came through, Webster Slaughter. Uh, we had, at one time, we had, you know, four first rounders, two of them were Hall of Famers on the front line. I played Warren Moon, our, our running back in a one back shoot was Lorenzo Hyde-Smith from Miami, Lorenzo White from Michigan State, Mike Rogier, and Alan Pinkett. I mean, I'm looking at myself going, in a one-back set, like, we need all these four guys. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I that was probably, like, my closest stint because I went to San Diego for one year, Cincy for two, and Pittsburgh my last. But Houston was kind of like my home in, in the NFL, and that's the guys I'm, uh, I'm closest with. And uh, But, yeah, I, I played with some... Uh, some great, great players and, and great stories, but uh, but like like I said, it, it still still doesn't measure up to uh, to what I, you know what I had with the Mountaineer family for sure. You know, um, one of the you know looking back at that time, Houston pretty much inter- engineered what they called the run and shoot back then. Um, you think yep. that was the you think that kind of bled over into what we're seeing now with college football throwing it? And- oh, that was you know that was a start with Miles Davis and uh, Dean Jones and, and I think Dean still coaching and uh, that was that was the spread way back then. They were way ahead of their time, but um, you know like they, then you got in some cold cold weather games up in Buffalo and, and you know you got in there in late in season in January. Uh, if you couldn't throw the ball, you know you better have a run game, like you guys said yesterday. I think. I might get to watch me said the Mountaineers threw the ball 12 times for a team in the Big 12 to throw a ball 12 times is pretty spectacular to win a game and, and, and run it, you know, run the football. But, you know, every, every great team, like you said, in the national championship, they play defense and, uh, they got a running game. And, you know, it's bonus when they, when they can throw the ball, like, you know, like the Bears and, and, and everybody else, but you still got to run the ball. Hey, Bo, this is John again. I, I hate to do this, but you mentioned Buffalo. I was wondering if you could talk about the, <laughs> game, the comeback game with Frank Reich. Oh, that was, uh, that was a nightmare. It, it's a funny story because, uh, we were, we were beating them. My, actually, my daughter was born and my mom was in, in Houston and she was flying home. She was getting on a plane and, and it was, uh, I think we were up 20, 28, three and a half. And all my friends, from Pennsylvania were in Buffalo because they were all Pittsburgh fans and uh the winner of that game was going to play Pittsburgh for the AFC Central. So we were up like that. Bubba McDowell comes out second half and uh picks up the first pass for up, you know, thirty five three. I'm like, oh here we come. And then it started. Frank Wright was in and um Gil Gilbert was the third string quarterback and I the next the 
I think one or two years later, I played with uh, Gail in uh, San Diego, and Gail said he was warming up and he was going in the next series. And one of our guys, uh, we screwed up a coverage. They scored. They were like, all right, give Frank another series, you know. So he did it again. He scored again. He's like, give Frank another series. So, you know, I, I keep harassing saying, damn, Gail, I wish you would have came in because it would have been an AFC Central game, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that, that up there in that Buffalo atmosphere, that's a different, you know, pro, pro stadium. I mean, usually there's some, there's some good and bad fans, but uh, up there, I mean, that, that's all they got up there. You're like in a neighborhood and you're up in the fans. And once that stadium turned, that momentum, uh, you know, in sports, momentum is it's so, so big. And when they start scoring one or two touchdowns, they're going to start coming back to them, worn through a pick and it just starts crumbling. And, you know, you know, what do you do? I mean, it was, uh, it was so chastity. I mean, that, that we did that. I mean, on a bus, it was just, I, I still can't believe when I see it now. And if I had a dime, for everybody that told me, hey, I just saw your uh, NFL Network, the greatest comeback ever to Houston. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, <laughs> so that kind of, that kind of, you know, that, that game, that game, I lost to Elway on a comeback. We had him fourth and seven. Lamar Latham had him in the, in the backfield. He came out, threw a ball, and they went down and kicked the field goal and, and with a minute four, four left. That, those two games, and obviously the, uh, the Notre Dame, I, I would get back to in a heartbeat and play again. I'd strap it up right now. You know, let's talk about something that's probably a little bit more uh, dear to your heart. Obviously, you were inducted into the WVU Sports Hall of Fame. And after all the right. years in, in the um, NFL, and you know, which can you just talk about what it was like for you to get that call and for, uh, for Morgantown and, and the university to acknowledge uh, your time in, at, at WVU? Yeah, I mean, I mean, to me, like I, you know, I, I tell people that one of the most best experience for me is, you know, I visited all the college and when I went down to West Virginia, I, I kind of knew that was home for me and uh, reminded me of my hometown and, and the guys. And like I said, we were fortunate to graduate 28 fifth year seniors and, and a lot of the guys are still tight off the field. And, uh, you know, that was always so special to me and, and all them years. And like you said, going through the losing seasons and then getting better every year and then playing for a national championship. Um, uh, that, <laughs> like I said, if, if the Hall of Fame wouldn't have happened, I'd still be, you know, uh, bleed blue and gold, and, and I would have been fine. But when I got that call, and and to know some of the great players that that's gone through there, and you know, gone to the NFL, and and I've gone to the NFL, and uh, to be in the Hall of Fame, I mean, it's it's such an honor. I'm so honored, and uh, you know, it's something I cherish uh, cherish a lot. Well, Bo, we're going to let you go, my friend, but um, I want to take this opportunity to say thanks for joining us here on the show. Um, we tried to get you on a couple of times. We were waiting. I know you traveled and you were on the road for football season, so things worked out great for you this weekend. But uh, thanks for yeah. coming on, man. It's always good to catch up with you. And, of course, I'll keep in touch. Hey, anytime, guys. And I uh, hope the Mounties uh, you can get one more and get in that bowl. And, like I said, keep uh, keep going because we're all, like I said, once, you, once you're once you a Mountie, you're always a Mountie, and I'm always full. So right. uh, great to talk to you guys anytime. Give me a call, guys. All right, brother. Thanks, man. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Bo Orlando. And um, Bo, Bo's been to Charleston a few times. He comes into town, and, and we do um, fundraising events. And he's he, – I, mean, I didn't know Bo that well. Just had been around him a couple times uh, at the university. And literally, when I say be around him, in the room, maybe I've had an interview with him. But I called him up, said, hey, we're doing this fundraiser. Here's what it's for. He's like, yeah, I'll be there. He's just an all-around good guy, hell of a good. To get. And it, it's always good to have him in for a weekend because dude likes to party, and that's that's what I like to have when we uh, when we when we have events. But uh, speaking of partying, it's Diddy's turn. Let's hand it out, man. Oh, I know most people probably think uh, they know who this one's going to go to, but this one goes to Eli Wellman, Mister Elijah Wellman, back there in the backfield, lining up. Moving the moving the bodies around, making holes, getting his first touchdown on his first carry this year. I think Wellman was the difference, uh, a big difference maker in that run game yesterday. I like the lead block situation with him as a fullback. I hope that continues, and uh, I like that part of the game. And Elijah Wellman, that's my beer of the week. They rewarded him too yesterday. Yeah, he got yeah. that touchdown. So that's a that's a good pick. You want to dish one out, John? Jared Barber, scoop and score. That guy's been a Mountaineer for, it seems like, 10 years, and he's battled injuries <laughs> and adversity and coaching changes and all that. So it was great to see him get a touchdown. And it, that really 
kind of shifted momentum in the game. So it was a huge play. It was a big play. Yeah, I, I echo that. I was gonna, I was gonna give one to Jared. Talking about somebody that deserves it, man. I mean, dude's been through the ringer. Had a, you know, been hurt. Uh, actually, I think he was hurt against Texas. Uh, wasn't that the game he got hurt in two years I ago? Think so, yes. I do. So, I so. To, to come back against Texas and scoop one and, and score, uh, yeah, man, beer of the week, uh, dish one out. And I and I tweeted to John Antonic yesterday. When's the last scoop and score? Do you guys know the last scoop and score? No, Chestnut had one against TCU last year. A scoop and score. Okay. Yeah. Was, I, did. Well, Darwin's was an interception return, correct? Or no, Darwin was a scoop. Well, somebody return. brought that up, but I thought it was more of a, a strip. Yeah. Like, he, he, dude was pretty much almost in the end zone in a scrum, and it was like he pulled it out. So, but yeah, we were, we were trying to figure that out yesterday. So just getting into some other stuff uh, before we dip out of here. Um, the men's team, men's and women's team played the other night. I didn't get to see it on television. Um, I was – kind of tied up with my daughter, but uh, I did listen to the radio, and again, it was north or northern Kentucky, I believe. Yeah. It's hard to tell what you got there, but um, I how, how'd they look? I think uh, I didn't get to watch the whole game. I know Crum did. I just listened to the first half, so Crum's probably best to, to tee you off on that situation because I just got to listen to the first half. Well, they, they were severely overmatched. They had nothing for us, and I – the, some of the stuff that I'm taking away from this game was we were up 30 at half. We kind of slept walk through the second half, but we still won by like 46. <laughs> John Holton stayed out of foul trouble. He had 14 points in 12 boards, I believe. So if we can get this guy to stay on the floor and not get in foul trouble, I think it makes our team a lot better especially rebounding. He does a lot of intangible stuff. He, he's the head of the press, and I, they just they were never comfortable. And we, we're picking up where we left off last year, I would say, with the whole press Virginia thing. You know, shoot, we shot the ball okay. I mean, I tell you what, to me it looked like we looked like 1996 Cincinnati, just athletes everywhere. All over the floor, blocking shots, alley oop dunks. I mean, it, it did not look like the West Virginia team we saw in the Big East. They're a lot more, I guess, athletic, and these guys look lean too. So I'm I'm curious to see. We we play in Charleston on Monday against James Madison. I would expect a similar outcome. Yeah, at this point in the season, though, just uh, I just like to like you said, I like to look at them, see what condition they're in, if they're getting bigger, uh, where their skill sets are. I mean, I don't really judge the competition. Well, if you remember last year, the first game, I forget who we played, like Lafayette or, or somebody, and, and we struggled. We we barely won the game, and I mean, we were trailing a l- large part of the game. But I think what you're going to see with this team we have so many guys who can play, and we're just going to wear teams out. The only negative was the amount of fouls. I, I don't know what college basketball is doing with officiating. I mean, it's it's getting comical with some of the fouls they call. Well, apparently the new emphasis is they're going to try to do what they did two years ago or three years ago with all the hand checking, and they're not going to let that stuff go. Um, so, and, and they talked about that. Um, it could be an issue. Um, they had the uh, – Head of a, one of the guys on the officials committee on uh, statewide sports line, and he talked. He had, was at the Temple scrimmage, and he mentioned that West Virginia didn't look like they were going to have an issue with the press. Um, their thing was the big guys were uh, were fouling a little more. So it's that type of thing that you know you've got to adjust, and we'll see. I'm sure they will. But the good thing is we've got ten guys you now, got ten or eleven. I, I tell you, Washington's another guy healthy. to keep an eye on. He got in foul trouble. I guess Huggins let him foul out. He had some weird fouls. Uh, Macon looks totally different. I mean, he had some dunks. He had a follow-up dunk yeah. I heard on the radio that yes. it sounded like uh, I had to kill that radio at halftime of the GW game. I had to shoot the second half. But uh, first half I listened to, it sounds like Dax is shooting the ball well. sounds like Carter's playing really well, still getting used to playing the point. But I think this team's going to be pretty exciting to, uh, to watch. And it sounds as though listening – to the game, it sounds as though that they're going to bank on a lot of turnovers leading to points, and you're going to play fast, and you're going to play quick. Well, and it should be exciting. They're unselfish, too. I mean, Ahmad, the guy I said keep an eye on, he didn't really do much, but 
he flowed in the offense, and I think he figured out early on, like, tonight's not my night to score. I'm just going to distribute and run the offense and rebound, and he did that. A lot of guys played a lot of minutes. So it's just can – you know, how much better is this press going to be versus last year? And we really have a test. The tournament in Vegas should be a good test. And then we play UVA non-conference. And that I think that game will will tell us what kind of team we have. And December 5th, December 6th game, that's yeah, but huge. You watch scores at the on the ticker roll by of teams that are picked, you know, Maryland and North Carolina and, and Kentucky. And even though they won big, they struggled a little bit early on in – we didn't struggle at all. It was well. Those teams are all they're all freshmen. Yeah, and it, you could tell within two or three minutes of the game, like we got up like sixteen to four, and we we're just going to roll them. Yeah. So that was good to see. Yeah. Well, and um, obviously the women got got started the other night against Delaware State, and um, they won convincingly. They have seventy seven thirty four. Uh, Bria Holmes is expected. I don't know if you guys, how close you guys follow the women's team, but Bria Holmes is expected to be, you know, to take a leadership role on that team. Uh, she didn't have a big night numbers wise. Um, it looks to me, just looking at the box score, that uh, Mike played a lot of different, uh, a lot of different ladies and uh, even some of the um, the girls that were coming off the bench. The one had, uh, Muldrow had 13 points, so he's expecting a big season after getting to the NIT final. And um, one of the cool things, and I guess we'll go ahead and announce and let everybody know, is we're going to be back in January. We're going to do a basketball show. So we'll we'll bring you guys uh, some WV basketball. We're going to do Section 304, do the Hoops edition, kicking off in January. We're going to do a preview show right around the Virginia game. So I guess it will be the week after our first uh, – <clears throat> Our last football game. We'll come yeah. back and uh Is Iowa State, I believe, or no. Is Iowa State that no, Kansas it's the State. week is yeah, yeah. Okay, there you yeah. go. Kansas. So State. we'll we'll be back the week after, right before the holidays kick in. Then we're gonna take a couple weeks off, uh regroup. Um we're we're gonna try to get uh try to get somebody special lined up for that show. I've been making a few phone calls and hope to have uh have somebody ready to go for that. Um, and also, too, before we dip out of here, the women's soccer team won their first round in the NCAA tournament. They blanked um, Duquesne for nothing. Uh, Nikki is a brown man. She's got that thing. What? How many? How many straight well, conference championships did they win up there? Four. Four. That's what I thought it was. That's you know. And, and I got to tip my hat to Dana. Her. That's how you coach. That's how you do it. That's what you shoot for. Well, she built that program from the ground up. When she got there, um, there was nothing. They were playing on that shitty field. Um, now they've got Dick Delesque Stadium. They've got their own practice facility. Um, she was, she was. They were wooing her at Michigan, trying to lure her up there along with Rich Rod and Beeline. I'm surprised <laughs> they just didn't move their university to Morgantown. They were t- trying to take all of our coaches. She stuck around, man. And she's got it. She's got it rolling up there. So I tip my hat to her. So you're telling me she's a real coach? Yeah, she's a great coach. Mm-hmm. Mike Carey's a great coach too. Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah. Die, we'll that, you want to talk about? A horrible program. The program he inherited was Bro, a train wreck. I was there at the end of the uh, at the end of the regime. I can't remember her name now. I tried to blank it out. But that her last season, um, there was the year that they had uh, asbestos removal in the Coliseum. <laughs> So they were playing up in like Wheeling. Their home well, music. the women were playing at Morgantown, Morgantown High, yeah. and UConn came to town. And Gino Oriama, it was a TV game. It was one of my very first TV games ever broadcasting of sports games. This is like 99, somewhere in there. So Gino Oriama comes in and realizes he's playing in a high school gym. He goes ape shit during their shoot around. He's pissed. Like he's got the athletic director in there. I mean, he's in there just, he's pissed off that they're playing in a high school gym. And he let West Virginia know about it. They beat them like 112 to 30. He pressed. But Gino's a prick, so I, I could see that. But uh, that program was literally in shambles. The highest recruit uh, on that team was uh, was Kate Bolger, and basically she was there by herself. Uh, the, the next player was I don't I, I don't want to dish on the kids. They just weren't a talented bunch. But with Kate Mike, was, Kate was Kate put fans in the seats with just her looks. Well, the only reason I ever went to watch Kate and Meg, we remember the Bulger sisters. Well, speaking of, <laughs> very solid. Speaking of, when we start uh, when we start basketball season, Meg's going to check in with us 
uh, periodically and give us uh, the scoop on the women's team. So she's going to be joining us here on Section 304. Uh, we'll try, you know, we'll try to bring her in weekly, every other week. We'll see, just kind of keep the eye on the women's team. I like, I like talking women too. But hoops, that's that was my that was my beat at WVU for a long time. So uh, the women's team is uh, yeah, I got a soft spot for, spot for the ladies. And, but um, before we dip out of here, next weekend we play Kansas. Um, real quick, well, it was, hell, it's a podcast, so we're not on it at any time. Real quick, obviously, that ought to be easy. We should we should win that game. Depend. I mean, I look for if you're going to get an opportunity to see another quarterback in mop up time, this should be the game. Uh, we should engineer a pretty pretty easy blowout in this one, and uh, hopefully, maybe you get a chance to look at uh, Sills, Crest, somebody, S- somebody. You know, let's engineer a blowout. This one shouldn't be hard. I think we'll. We should win going away. I, I the game two years ago is still on my mind. So I, I hope they're ready to play and realize what they have in front of them. They should win this game fairly easy, though. Yeah. I expect to see Smallwood, more Smallwood, more of what we saw against Texas, and we should. I'm thinking 37 to 13. That's not going to get Sills under center. Well, well you got to go bigger than that. Well, you know, just just. Looking at what we lived through in October, I would hope that this team would be ready to just kind of kick the shit out and try to kick the shit out of anybody that's in front of them and not take anybody for granted. You lose four in a row, you can't come out and just say it's, oh, it's Kansas, because that's a good way to get an L and not pick up your sixth win. Yeah. So, um, well, the atmosphere is going to be dead. It's going to uh, be like yeah, going to the, Temple. Remember going to doesn't Temple? Doesn't their field have a track around it? I think they draw. I think their field has a track around it. What a shithole. They only draw like. Five thousand people. It's a basketball <laughs> school with a football. Even when they were winning, you know, not, not too long ago they were eleven and one and playing in a BCS game. And the I still, you know, yeah, they screwed up by firing him. I the think. man genius. But uh, but if you're going to be checking out the Mountaineer game next weekend, um, I really would love to see everybody come out and uh, come out to Buffalo Wild Wings on Saturday. I've got a little group. Uh, a little project that I do every year uh, with the Sugar Bowl Foundation. We're going to be at Buffalo Wild Wings. We're having a game watch party out there. We do a silent auction. Got tons of autographed pictures. Um, we do a raffle at halftime, which our friends at the Bearwood Company are going to sponsor. We raffle like 20 items off. T-shirts, jerseys, autograph pictures, and that type of thing. Uh, we worked hard. I worked hard on trying to get a guest, and, um, and, and I wasn't able to – Coach Nealon was going to come, but uh, Coach's wife is uh, dealing with some health issues, and we just couldn't get it quite worked out. Plus, you know, it's tough. He's 80 years old, driving from Morgantown in the morning, driving back. Um, but he really wanted it to work out. But what happened was the people, that the ladies that come and sit with uh, his wife weren't able to, to come that weekend. So we're not going to have a special guest, although I've reached out to a couple guys. We might have a surprise guest. Who knows? But just come out. Check it out. If You're going you're to be out in the sports bars anyway. It's a great place to come. All the proceeds from the event uh, fund my uh, annual visit to the Davis Child Shelter here in Charleston. And uh, I'll be heading up there on Christmas Eve this year uh, delivering the gifts. So uh, I look forward to a Mountaineer win this next week. And I uh, want to thank everybody for taking time to download Section 304. Don't forget, coming uh, in the winter next here in January, we will be doing basketball. We've got some new stuff coming on the horizon. So thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. And we will see you guys next week. Producer for Section 304 is Steve Adams for SAA Productions. SAA Productions specializes in affordable, small-scale audio and video projects. Wanted to jump on the podcast bandwagon? Call 304-299-1234. That's 304-299-1234. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook and on Twitter.